Welcome back to Power of the Mind, the podcast where we give you simple tools to improve your relationship with yourself and with other people. Today's episode is all about weight loss. We're going to talk a lot about some of the psychology behind weight loss. What are some of the issues that get in the way of moving in the direction of our goals, whatever they happen to be? And also, what is the motivation for weight loss for each individual? And, and how can that play a part in getting to a spot that we feel comfortable about ourselves? Stick around. It's a good one. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Talking Glass Media and Cast 11 Studios with Power of the Mind presented by Granite Mountain Behavioral Healthcare. How's it going, Gray? It's going good. It's How's going. it going with you? It is going well. So when you walked in today, we were talking about, um, we've done quite a few podcasts now. I, how many have we done? 19, 20, 20 I think, 20? 23, 26. 26. Holy mackerel. Holy moly. This is number 26. So the most popular to date, I thought it was going to be PTSD because I loved that series that we did on PTSD. Yeah, that's um, a fun one. I figured narcissism would be up there. It actually was number two. The one podcast that I did not even want to air was the um, weight loss one. Oh, yeah. Why didn't you want to air it? Well, because it was me kind of coming out of my shell with, you know, <laughs> um, it's one thing to... Vulnerability there. Yeah, it's a little vulnerable. It's like sure. you're admitting that first step is admitting you have a problem. I read that in a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was yeah. like a I've step, heard that before. step one, right? Step one. Yeah. Step one. So for me, it was admitting there was a problem. And it was that, you know, and I'm probably a little more comfortable to talk about it now than I was even, you know, three or four weeks ago. It was the kind of the once you've lost some weight, you're able to talk about all the stuff that was bad about, you know, needing to lose weight. So for me, it's a little more. But when the episode came up, I was like, I don't think it was that good. I don't, I don't, I think it was just too, nobody's going to care about that. Really? I enjoyed it. I, because you were, you're awesome. And oh, for me, it was okay. very difficult for me to talk about losing weight. It's like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, people are going to be judging me. Oh, judging, sure, sure. Judging people. So I wanted to tell you a story. So I'm, I'm still on my journey. I'm still doing my thing. And I don't want to call it a diet because I'm trying to train my brain. Making it a lifestyle. Making it a, a lifestyle. Or whatever, yeah. But I wanted to talk about because you've mentioned it and I think we touched on it on the weight loss podcast when you were talking about like trauma and things like that. It was, I was working out religiously like four to five times a week doing mm. these, um, just right over here at the gym, doing some yeah. classes. And what I was probably about 10 pounds lighter than I am right now. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling super confident, you know, working out and a husband and wife came in and they were just like, you know what, Alicia, the awesome job like you are here all the time you're killing it you look fantastic this is great keep it up i never went back and i don't know why i don't oh. i can blame it on, i can't even tell you why it wasn't a conscious deci decision at that moment to say i'm done i'm not going back there but what what happened well what was it about the experience that was challenging for your what it's obviously it's memorable right so yeah. one of the things that's really interesting about our memories we have the option to choose between any one of a, a few thousand probably several thousand memories that we could pick at any given moment you remember the experience which tells you that it's significant right mm -hmm. if i was like tell me about a different time you went to the gym you might be able to come up with something but this one sticks out to you so what was significant about the man and the woman talking to you i don't know if it was something with you've done it like people are telling you it's great you've maybe you've accomplished i don't need to do anymore look i've mm. i'm there i've done there i've hit my goal or whatever i don't know i just i worked for a guy once that told me you know i never compliment people i never mm. and he didn't say this to me it was kind of the running like people who knew him would say this like he doesn't compliment anybody like, hey, you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Because in his mind, once you were told you were doing a good job, you reached it, you're done. Mm -hmm. So I always think about that. Was that what convinced me like, oh, I don't have to do this anymore. Ugh. He said I looked great. I was mm -hmm. killing it. That's really interesting. So I don't know. Seems like a worthwhile theory. Do you remember anything in particular about the couple? Um, Do you know them? Are they friends, nope. acquaintances? I, they were at the class all the time. So we always did the <clears> classes <throat> together. And it was, I mean, I always wanted to be front and center because that's kind of my, it's kind of I'm, my thing. I'm actually not surprised to hear that no, about you. No, I that's, figured. Yeah. Yeah, I'm super shy. But I'm very competitive. So I would always kind of position myself next to somebody who I thought was great at working mm -hmm. out and stuff. And mm -hmm. so I'd watch them and can I keep up with them? 
Can I match the weight that they're putting on the barbell? Can I, you know, do as many squats as they can? So that was kind of always my thing. But that day, like I never, never went back. And of course the weight came back and then, you know, you lose it and it comes back. And my thing is, how do I make it different today? You know, it's sure, like, sure. we're 40 pounds down. Do you know where, where does it go from here? And what is going to keep me from like, right now there's only 10 marbles left in the jar like i've only got to lose 10 more to get to that 50 and then what do i put 10 more in do i i don't want my brain to get lazy and go you've won you did it you hit those 50 marbles you can relax now right like what right well that is the challenge isn't it right there's relax mode and there's go mode for a lot of us and so the question you're having is you know how do i find myself in a space where i remain in go mode um, or is goal mode where I want to be? Like, you know, it's kind of like, what do I, yeah. what do I do in this situation? So a couple things come up. One, if I want to understand weight loss, I want to understand really clearly what my motivation is. Because once I understand my motivation, I have one of the pieces. And for folks, a lot of times, because there is so much, we'll call it input or data coming from the outside world about their weight, right? Their doctor give them a hard time about being overweight because being overweight is actually pretty bad for your body. And the doctors are are not excited about that. They want you to live and do well. So that's part of it. Um, There's the cultural side of things. There's feedback from friends and family. There's feedback from other people. And so um, a couple things that come up for me is, you know, if if I want to understand the motivation for losing weight, um, what do you think your motivation is? What is it that gets you moving in that direction? Yeah, because you could talk about health, which yeah. if I was a you know decent person, I'd be like, ah, I want to be healthy. I want to live forever. <laughs> but it's like I, <laughs> that's I like it's, it's very honest, you know, yeah. and most people will say that maybe like, yeah. oh, I want to be healthy and I want to be there for my children well, and my grandkids. you're not necessarily at an, and, at an age where your life yeah, is flashing before your eyes either. No. So. And it's not one of those things where that's what gets me out of bed. That's what gives me to, gets me to not eat the pizza. It's mm-hmm. for me. I want to look good. Like I want uh, to, um, I'm in competitive cheerleading. My, you know, I run a cheer gym and there's that part of me that when I walk out on the stage with the girls, like I want to, I want to look good. And that's so, and that's hard to say out loud now. It's easier now because I'm halfway there maybe. And, but before I would never have said that. Like, oh, oh okay. I own a cheer gym. I should look the part, you mm, know? So okay. That for me, that's my motivation. Okay. Well, Is so, my heart healthier? Sure. Can I go up a flight <laughs> of stairs without dying? Pretty much. Yeah. I, could, I jogged them the other day. I went up Whoa. like quite rapidly without breathing hard. Do I, can I, you know, sit in an airplane chair without freaking out that is the seatbelt going to fit? Because that is something when you're heavy that goes through your mind, you know, is that seatbelt going to fit? Yeah. And I'm happy to say I got on a plane a couple of weeks ago and I had like excess, excess weight there, excess, um, Seatbelt. So yeah, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who won't fly. Yeah, it's because uh, of their weight and who are, you know, can I sit in a booth and be okay? Are we going yeah. to the restaurant? You want a, a booth or a table? Table. 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 Yeah. Table. Table. Oh crap! Somebody said booth first. What do I do now? You know, that's yeah. That's a thing that people who don't have a challenge with their weight don't realize it shows up for people. Yeah, I don't think that people who have never been heavy understand because I've, I mean, people might argue, but I've never been, you know. I'm not going to appear anytime soon on my 600 pound life, but sure. I'm at a place where, you know, it was, you go to a theme park and it's like, hmm. am I going to be able to fit on that? Right. I saw, we were at Knott's Berry farm last two years ago <clears throat> and I get on the, the dragon swing hmm. and getting there. And it's like, oof, you get that belted in. I was like, Oh, okay, we're good. The lady across from me was with two friends that was, they were very thin. She was not, and it didn't fit. She the, had to get that up. bar wouldn't go down. And so they asked her to, she had to get off the ride. And her two friends had to get off the ride with her. Mm. And I was devastated for her, like to have to go through that. Yes, you, and, could, you could understand what that must be like. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, like that was horrible. And so the things that when you're, you know, the body shaming, I think it's the, when you see somebody, you immediately, I think in human nature, you kind of size them up. And so it's well we are we are a competitive species right mm-hmm. people um forget sometimes that um 
you know, in nature, the dominant people, the dominant individuals, the people at the top of the hierarchy eat first. Yeah. And we live in a world where there's always enough food, at least most of us do. And so it's easy to forget that uh, that that competitiveness you're mentioning is kind of hardwired in. And mm -hmm. that we talk about judgment as though it is a, a bad thing. And it's not a particularly socially helpful and probably isn't, um, you know, morally advisable in most systems in the world. <laughs> and it is innate. And the reason mm -hmm. it's innate is because I need to understand where I sit in the hierarchy at any given time. Because if I'm in a bad spot in the hierarchy, that's gonna create anxiety for me right. biologically. Now again, none of that's strictly speaking true now, but you don't have to go back too far to a time when it was very important mm -hmm. to measure up to society's expectations in order to not die. Yeah. So uh, that that's a real, when we when we when we think about the brain and the mind as it relates to anything but particularly weight and particularly food you know food is a, a pretty primal element of the psyche and i think it's the basal ganglia i can't remember which part of the brain i divide the brain into three sections right you have your cerebral cortex the part of you that thinks and talks and does all kinds of cool stuff plans ahead worries about the future regrets the past i mean some stuff that's not as cool i guess but that's the part that we think of as us then you have the uh the limbic system which is becoming much better known now because people talk about it on instagram and, and talk about it in different places but the limbic system is all those parts of the middle of your brain that do the fight and the flight and a lot of the more instinctive sort of more animal type of things that that we do then you have the the core the the base of the brain the brain stem and that takes care of all the habitual stuff a lot of the habitual stuff you know breathing you don't sit and think breathe yeah. breathe well, out <sighs> right yeah. that, that would take a lot of uh of work but yeah the, the middle part of the brain also does a lot of our habits and does a lot of our habits around food in particular but to get back to kind of the the topic you were talking about and trying to understand you know the why of it right and it comes back to this idea that i want to look good so ask yourself it'd be interesting to to see how deeply you want to explore the question why do you want to look good hmm. it's funny because my husband implemented um a big girl sunday so oh. we call it fat girl sunday and it's like he's cooking and he's adding extra barbecue sauce on the ribs and stuffing these potatoes full of butter and he's like mm. I don't care what you do Monday through Saturday, but on Sunday we're gonna, you know, we're gonna eat a family dinner. We're gonna, you know, and he's very supportive of the weight loss side. However, I know his goal is not for me to be thin. Mm. He wants, like, such chubby mama. He likes oh. that. So, for me, that's got to play somewhere in the grand scheme of things, but. It's this is the first weekend where he was like, you need to eat like you need to let's uh, have dinner. And and it was like, I said, you're putting a lot of like he opened the potatoes and like stuffed them with butter and cooked them with the butter in the middle. I'm like, we have never done that before. And he's like and he was like, oh, it's, you know, that girl cheating Sunday. Like you have whatever you want. It's football day, you know, just yeah, eat. Yeah. And I'm like, so I know that he's super supportive, but what the heck dude what is he doing with that is it more of a reward like you've worked all week now here's you get to cheat on this and i even told him yesterday morning i said ha didn't work i'm still down half a pound from oh, friday boy, boy, yeah. so because i have portion control so uh, i knew like what you're sure, cooking for sure. me is bad but mm -hmm. i'm going to eat way less than i would have you know 65 70 days ago so sure so that was difficult for me. It's like, what are you doing to mess with? You know, I want to look good, but I already look good for him. Like I'm already there for him. So mm -hmm. this is more mm -hmm. about, you know, I think the type of job I have where, you know, I'm in the community a lot, you know, coaching a chair team. I just want to be confident because I'm very confident here, but I need to be able to back it up almost. I think I don't, I don't know That's the right way to say it, but yeah, it's you like seem pretty confident. Yeah, I, I am. I, but it's very difficult when you're you seemed, overweight. You seemed pretty confident before too, actually. I, I'm telling you, I, like I, it, I think I have reverse, um, like reverse body image. Oh, okay. Because I would always see myself as, eh, it's not too bad. Sure. And then I'd see a picture and go, who is? Oh, that's yeah. me. 
And then one day a switch flips and you say, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to do this right. differently. So. so question for you. You mentioned mm -hmm. that the thing, the story you told at the beginning of going back to the gym. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about that thing at the gym, I think you mentioned you were maybe 10 pounds lighter than you are now. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So I'm getting scared. So, well, so I would imagine <laughs> at that point, you know, we can, you'd have to have your husband here to answer the question you asked earlier, the what the heck, mm -hmm. right? Um, we can, we could probably offer some theories and, and uh, but we, we don't know for sure. But um, would you say that this, this pattern of your husband starting to um, encourage you to move in a different direction is pretty consistent at about this space, this spot? Um, I think so, because he was always, you know, you don't need to go to the gym. You don't need, why are you going to the gym? Yeah. We have five acres in the backyard. Go walk, you know, the property. You don't need to go to the gym. So what we've touched on with him is, you know, the abandonment issues and, mm -hmm. you know, always mm -hmm. worried about, you know, any of that, you know, just, she's going to leave. And so I think maybe being an armchair psychiatrist is the oh my gosh, maybe I self-sabotage myself. So I mean, that, you host this show, you're basically yeah, trained. I'm basically at certified, this point. actually. Yeah, I mean, you're, so you're, I think you're pretty I much a professional, 30 I think. episodes, right? 30 yeah. episodes, yeah, yeah, that's the but that's I, the honorary master's degree right there, so. Well, and that's, I mean, doing this with you is, you know, it really helps me look into things, you sure. know? So it was maybe to ease his comfort and his, you know, I mean, it's easier for me to, put it on him right it's your fault i've given up on diets but is mm. it i don't know well you know it would be really interesting you're talking about having this conversation in the gym where somebody outside of your immediate circle who you don't know particularly well but who you're familiar with mm -hmm. says hey you've arrived mm -hmm. and there's a little part of your brain that says okay i'm here Phew. all is well let's let's be done with all this noise and um if that was correlated with getting some encouragement to that effect from home Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, a lot of us have a, in a long-term relationship or a marriage, it's definitely, you know, my, my spouse, you know, for me, my wife's my best friend and her opinion on what I should do and how I should do it matters a lot to me. And she's, you know, I've actually, it's funny, we're talking about weight loss today. I think I'm down about 25 pounds from when I started, which was about a year and a half ago. So I've wow. been going a little piece at a time. That's the best um, way, right? Yeah. And I, one thing that was really helpful for me is I, I saw a naturopath and my hormones were way off. My estrogen was sky high and that was resulting in some uh, challenges that way. But so, yeah, you, you have this feedback coming from uh, home and that, you know, your your husband is really, for most folks, the spouse is, is probably the most important person to them mm -hmm. as far as the feedback and the influence goes at the very least it's the person i spend the most time with so uh, there's a decent chance i'm going to value their feedback quite a bit now of course we have um, all the dynamics that show up in marriage that can also get in the way of that but so you're getting some feedback there and you think oh, i don't know if his motivations are yeah. exactly right but then boom you get this feedback at the gym you think well those guys i mean they know what they're doing they're, they're not every day. they're not worried about being left or abandoned they're just yeah. hanging out at the gym and telling me i made it so maybe i do need to maybe this is happening i think right? i'm done right yeah, i think i'm done so so that's one thing that's that's really interesting is to look at at that part of the process around when am i done yeah and what is enough what is um because weight loss can be it can go to extremes. Dangerous, right? It certainly worked with end. plenty of eating disorders and seeing how that part works. Young yeah. people are uh, particularly susceptible to them, but they can last well into adulthood. And um, that can be a big part of the process there too. I'm just trying to get through the psychology of this is your life now. Like this is how you're going to eat from now on, or this is how you're going to control portions. I don't want it to be a You've reached the finish line. Now you can stop. Right. So how do you, and I'm, I'm rethinking things way more than I ever did on any other time that I've, you know, lost the 40 pounds and gained it back because it was always just like, oh, I'm on a diet. I'm not on a diet. I'm eating better. I'm having smaller portions. I eat healthier. The things that I choose to eat are better for me. So, and I think that just helps from talking to you too, and kind of putting those things in, you know, what's important. So, because I don't want to get to the finish line and then be done. I don't want to just go, oh, phew, we made it. 
So the way I reasoned with him is we've got 10 more pounds, 10 more marbles. Sure. And then let's see. And he he's really good at saying things like, this is your journey. Where yeah. you're comfortable is where I want you to be happy. And then he does, you know, Fat Girl Sunday, but whatever. Well, so, you might, I mean, with most of us, one of the things you learn in psychology, there's a whole branch of therapy called internal family systems where we do parts therapy. And it could be that there is a part that is very excited to help you out and a part that's very nervous. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, if I have a lot of neglect, and again, we're talking hypothetically here, he'd have to be here to really confirm this, but it's not uncommon if I grow up in an environment where there's a lot of neglect, we take our cues from our environment in terms of who we are and how valuable we are and, and, and of what utility we are in this world. And if my environment as a kid says, you're not worth much, and we kind of wish you weren't here. A hundred percent. Then there's a decent chance that there's going to be a little voice in the back of my head that's always says, well, you know what? Things are going okay. But you also might be just a couple inches away from going back here. Because that's yeah. the core. That's There is a, a part of me that believes that most of what I grew up with is true for most of us most of the time. So... Um, if I got that feedback as a kid and it, the world outside me is not conforming to that idea, there often will be a little voice in my head that says, be careful, watch out, it's just around the corner. Yeah. It's actually very confusing for people to outperform their self-esteem. I had an employee once who was brilliant, one of the best, particularly in terms of group facilitation, one of the best I'd ever seen, amazing and moved up very quickly, but moved up to a point that clearly was beyond his comfort zone and started to self-sabotage. And I told him he was doing it, mm -hmm. and he was relentless at putting himself down. He had a ton of self-doubt. He started to interface with his coworkers in a way that, uh, you know, he would, he would just, just move, buy them sort of inappropriate gifts, not inappropriate like, Oh, just just too much, right? Yeah. Not understanding reciprocity and, and social protocol, so to speak, stepping outside of social protocol. And eventually he lost his job. Fascinating mm -hmm. um, example. And I said, you know, this is, this is a, a really clear cut example of you just outperforming your self-esteem. So people, we really are, are pretty good at that. All the research on the lottery winners is probably the best example you can think of, right? Mm -hmm. um, or some of the athletes who grow up in poverty and become incredibly wealthy. And a few years later, you think, man, how did, it must have taken a lot of work to get rid of all that money. Yeah. Like, I mean, that must have taken some real effort on your part. And a lot of that is kind of similar. The The world we have inside, if, if the outside world gets too far from that, it, it can be a little confusing and uncomfortable. So uh, not necessarily thinking that that's what's happening at home yeah. for you, but it's, it's worth- But it does make sense. It's yeah, like, yeah. I just- It's certainly a good theory anyway. And I remember back as a kid, my mom was always on a diet and mm -hmm, she was mm -hmm. to the point of anorexia as, as well. Oh, like, sure. So that's an interesting, mm -hmm. that's like the, kind of the next question is what does food mean to you in terms of your family and what did it mean to you growing up? You know, as a kid, I remember always counting. Okay, there's four of us at the table. There are six pieces of chicken. Okay, so everybody's going to get one. If I'm going to get two pieces, I'm going to have to act fast. Like I'm going to yeah. have to eat this really quick and then get the second one. And it's weird because we always had plenty of food. It wasn't like it was a shortage of food. Um, like in my oh. house where we had five kids, it was like, you get in here quick or, you know, and I would always make the plates for everybody so that everybody got their right. fair share. But whatever right. is left, it was like, you know, jump in and get it. Yeah. But it's just crazy to me because I, you know, just having that at even five, six years old of being able to like take inventory of what was on the table of you know, okay, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna get seconds, I gotta, you know, cause dad's gonna get the second piece and mm -hmm. so yeah. crazy. So it's doing the just, math and yeah. figuring out, and again, a lot of that can be part of the competitive piece we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, figuring out yeah. where you are in the hierarchy and uh, you know, well, I, I want more food, so I'm gonna yeah. get it, I'm gonna take it. And well, and I was the favorite, right? So sure. dad's favorite. So of course I have higher hierarchy over Sure. My mom and my Do sister, it. are you kidding me? Heck yeah, I'm getting that second piece of food. And when I when I have that situation where I have a parent who favors me, particularly over my mom, 
um, that sense of competitiveness tends to become even more highly developed because there is an unconscious competition going on Always. and yeah. your mother probably wouldn't have been able to name it. Maybe she would, I, mean, I don't know, but most of the time mom isn't able to name it. And actually it's very confusing for the mom because how do I, why would I want to get in the way of this, you know, purportedly healthy and good relationship between my husband and his daughter, my daughter. Uh, so it's very conflicting mm -hmm. in that regard. And, and typically uh, by adolescence, the relationship is a bit challenged and it's also the sibling rivalry tends to be much more pronounced in a family system like that. It, it can be very, uh, sometimes it can be pretty severe. So those are all common characteristics when we have that dynamic between a parent mm -hmm. and a kid. So, yeah, but you get back again to this question of what does, you know, what does size mean to you? Um, I want to look good. Well, who do you want to look good to? Mm. I think just, you know, obviously my husband, but yeah. that doesn't, it doesn't completely make sense because he's there. Well, like he's you, good. You pass that threshold too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, but I do notice, you know, like yesterday it was, oh, he just checked me out. That's my husband, but he checked me out. You know, it wasn't ah, just a, yeah. hey, how's it going? But it was like a, just out of the corner of his eye, I caught that. And I was like, okay, well, this is new because he loves me and he loves all of me all the time. But yeah, you, got a, you got a really good husband there. Yeah, he's very he supportive and very, gentle and kind. And, but I saw that a little fire in his eyes, you know, and he, yeah. it wasn't just a, oh, that's mama and I, I just love her. It was, okay, you know, and yeah. so that to me was, okay, we're doing it. That's kind of nice. I don't want to see that from other people. Like, you know, mm. I don't want to attract attention from, you know, just random people. I don't want to be. Hmm. Well, that's, that's interesting because that's an inevitable consequence of what right. you're doing. I know. It's going to be a bummer, but. Um, I have yeah. to beat them off with of sticks. But that's not my goal. I don't, I want the, this is going to sound crazy, but the people who, um, you know, there's a saying, if every time you lost weight, you could put it on somebody who doesn't like you, <laughs> I could drop a hundred pounds in a second. But it's that, I mean, I want people who maybe, you know, I want them to look at me and go, okay, like, dang, she looks good or whatever. I oh, want, okay. there's. It doesn't sound crazy. That just sounds honest. Okay. That's, yeah, well, and like that you're is telling too. Yourself it's like, the truth, and that's really important in the yeah. process, right? Is to be able to be clear with yourself about what is really what's real, what's going yeah. on here for me. Well, and I want my cheerleaders to be proud of me too. Like when we're at a competition, I want them to be like, "Yeah, that's our coach." Do you see her? Like that's mm -hmm. our person, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. lots of different um, things going on, and and just I mean, the people I hang out with are thin, and you know, I sure. just want to just want to feel better and. That's a so, lie. I don't want to feel better. I want to. I want to look good. That's well, it. So what we discover again is is um, or what we what it sounds like you're saying is that you have a strong desire to look good, um, not because you have a deep longing to be attractive to yeah, other right. men. That actually is really um, it sounds like that has moved you in the other direction in the past, right. perhaps but rather because you're recognizing that you're in a competitive world and that your appearance is part of that mm -hmm. overall context of competition. Is that right? Yeah, I, I agree. And the confidence of, I mean, I, I cold call. I walk into places all the time and I notice the, you know, when you're heavier, people tend to either look past you or kind of ignore you almost. Hmm. And I'm not looking for... You know, there's, there's ample research that backs that up, yeah, interestingly I, enough. We yeah. are much more... We tend to ascribe better characteristics to people who are, mm -hmm. um, you know, who we, who we decide are attractive. And we also give them the benefit of the doubt. We, we tend to trust them more. We believe they're more trustworthy in their behaviors. Mm -hmm. There's a number of really... Um, there's a lot to it. And it's it's surprising and sort of you know, kind of disturbing, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of talk in my field about privilege right now. And I think it's really interesting because there's talk about privilege based on class and culture, but, uh, I, you know, there's certainly privilege based on being attractive in the eyes of the world. And so there are some folks who are very upset about that. I don't know that that's going anywhere soon. Mm -mm. Um, it seems to be not, but that's an important 
piece of things in right. in your side of things is, is what you're talking about is just recognizing that um, things work differently for you if you right well and there's the confidence too like of look good. wow I feel good I look good mm-hmm. I'm gonna go in there and you know I'm getting a new client today but I'm telling you if I was you know 120 pounds wearing a cute skirt and a blouse and walked into an auto shop there's any guys that are going to be waiting to talk to me about whatever I'm selling. Sure. You walk in and it's not that case. It's like, uh, yeah, I'm, t- you've been helped, you know? So sure, sure. there's, and that's just being honest with the, well, the situation. Cause those are things I've never like had the, I guess just not had the awareness or the courage maybe to talk about it or to say it out loud because yeah. it's just, if you look at two real estate agents and one is, you know, wearing a nice suit and she's, you know, put together and, and you've got somebody that's frumpy and sloppy. I mean, you're going to just knee jerk. You're going to think this person is way more capable than this person. Mm. So these are just things I've kind of talked to myself through of of the whys. Why do I want to lose weight? Why do I want to get there? And how is it going to help me? Not much is living longer or whatever, but with the other stuff, you know, the, the confidence and the, you know, even with my job. So. Sure, sure. So there's a lot of benefit that you're aware of, right? Mm-hmm. What's interesting now is to also to look at what the cost is mm-hmm. and what the fears are attached to it. What people are surprised about, there's not going to be, I think, a lot of folks who listen to the podcast and think, whoa, what a surprise. Uh, yeah. What she's saying there doesn't make any sense to me. Where people often do come into surprises is when they understand that there's a part of them similar to what we talked about earlier. There's a part of me that really wants all these things. Yeah. And yet, it sounds like for a long time at least, um, that part, there was another part that uh, wanted something else. Right. And there can be a lot of different things that I want. Uh, short-term enjoyment of things. Sugar is intensely addicting. People don't always realize that biologically, um, sugar is really designed, manufactured sugar and actually white flour hits the body and the, the system in a very similar way to sugar because of how unbleached flour is processed. It, it really becomes sugar as soon as you eat a piece of white bread and a Snickers bar hit the body in a surprisingly similar way. I think the Snickers mm-hmm. bar still wins as far as the sugar goes, but the piece of white bread is, is much closer to it than we give it credit for, let alone all the corn syrup and all of our everything we drink mm-hmm. and most of what we eat. I think I heard a stat one time that if you pulled everything out of the grocery store that had sugar as an ingredient, it would be uh, 20% of what's in there would be left. So really uh, an amazing amount of biological impetus to eat and to consume sugar. So that's a big part of it. And then we can look at what you said earlier, you know, your uh, the attention of men or women, depending on how a person is oriented and kind of, you know, what they're looking for. But the attention of uh, potential partners can be either very appealing or very scary, or in some cases, both. Mm -hmm. It can be appealing and scary at the same time. It can be scary because I've had bad experiences with men or women, but it can also be scary because I've made choices I regret around men and women. Um, I think of a client one time who had early in her relationship had an affair. And shortly after the affair, um, we came in talking about weight loss and the challenges attached to it, being on yo-yo diets for a very long time. And uh, shortly after the affair, and she didn't obviously make that connection at the time, but we, we realized, oh, you had the affair then. And look, within a year or two, you're in a space where you believe you you're can safe, right? drive people away, yeah. right? You don't you're not making the choice because this particular client was very agreeable and uh, happy-go-lucky and and sort of a peace-loving human being. And so when people approached her, um, she really struggled to say no and even could talk herself into believing she wanted to say yes, even though it was outside her value system, Hmm. right? So that's the other thing is if I'm looking at losing weight from a psychological perspective, and I do think it's almost always a psychological issue. Losing weight strictly speaking, is just a math problem. You do a math problem every day. Now, again, uh, I was talking earlier in my case, there are some hormones, you know, I had enough estrogen in my body that I think I probably, my 
my naturopath said I probably could have starved myself and I still wouldn't lose any weight. Uh, there, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's pretty well documented how to lose weight. Mm -hmm. So when I'm struggling with that, the cause, generally speaking, is psychological and uh, often rooted in trauma. Mm -hmm. Very, very frequently. So. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. I just wonder if it's, you know, people... I don't necessarily think that's the case in your... In your just to be so. clear, I don't know if that's the case no, for you. I think for me, it's just, it's hard. It's not easy. It's easier yeah. to go and eat a donut or to, you know, run through McDonald's. It is not fun. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, it's exciting today. I'm going to have 1,200 calories. And when so much of our lifestyle is around food, you know, mm -hmm. that's everybody finds joy cooking in the kitchen. And, you know, that's what we do, right, holidays right. and game days and stuff. So football season's been a bit challenging for me. Oh, but sure, sure, sure. It well, is. All that stuff is mm -hmm. about habit, too. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, Anheuser-Busch has gone to great lengths to make sure that you associate football with beer in a Pavlovian way, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you're male. Yeah. Um, there's a particular demographic that they advertise to pretty relentlessly and, and delightfully, effectively. Their their ads often are very funny and enjoyable. But even um, the women are like, oh, the Clydesdale, you know, the, sure, they all, the puppies. They've, they've done a really good job. You know, the, mm -hmm. the thing with food is it's almost, uh, it's incredibly habitual. It's built very deep into the habitual piece of the mind. And so that's the other challenge I have is, is if I make a change, uh, habits can take a long time to form. You know, everybody in the culture has heard the idea that it takes 21 days to form a habit. But the reality is some research indicates that habits can be formed in 14 days. And some research indicates that it takes over 200 days, depending on the type of habit and how it works. So it's not a simple or easy process. The other thing that's really interesting, we talk about changing habits is that social context plays a huge, huge, huge role. Mm -hmm. So having friends and family who are supportive or particularly people who are going on the, the journey with me who I can check with, in with on a regular basis is also very, very important being part of a community of some kind. It's very important to changing whatever habits mm -hmm. I'm trying to change. It's funny you said something that just jarred a memory. The last time that I was doing this, it's been, it'll be two years in November, mm. It's doing my thing and it was Thanksgiving. The food is all laid out and I'm making a plate and my husband casually says, be careful. You work so hard. Don't mm. sabotage yourself. Like don't, you know, just don't blow it today. Mm. I was so mad. I was so mm. mad that he would say that to me. It's like, mm -hmm. it's Thanksgiving. Just let mm. me have this, mm -hmm. you know? And I stopped my diet that day. Wow. Not even like, well, forget it. I'm stopping my diet. It was just like, I'm I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Boy, he he did a really good job of not doing that this time, didn't he? Oh yeah, because he's yeah. really he but remembered he's really... he remembered his mistake. He's that kind of guy. He's, yeah, he's he like, if I yeah, do I something just... that bugs you, I'll, I'm going to help you next time. So. Maybe, huh? So well, now I it's mean, more like could hey, be anything, but now he's he's not going to ever clearly say that to not me doing again, that, right? right? Yeah, because it was you know just be careful. You've been working so hard. And I was like, oh, how dare you say that to me? Like. Yeah. And he was being so kind. It was sure, like from his poor, heart. Confused husband, yes. Yeah, yes. he's like, I, I, what did I do? I'm like, I don't even. <laughs> everybody, eat your pumpkin pie. I don't care. Oh no, yeah, it's crazy. So I think that there's a lot to learn about weight loss. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to learn about the psychology that goes into it. I think that's the new thing now. Is just mm -hmm. the psychology of losing weight. So I'm trying to read books and read motivational things that help get your brain straight. Well, so you should probably read Dopamine Nation. There's a Serotonin Nation. Research hey, guy. Google, will you tell us if it's, I think it's Dopamine Nation, but I, I get my neurotransmitters confused sometimes. I'm, all, I, I'm positive it's Dopamine Nation. It is. Yeah, okay. It's Dopamine Nation. Um, it goes at great length. She does such a good job. This woman is just brilliant and very accessible in terms of describing uh, why habits are there and why we get addicted to food and why we get addicted to, well, really everything is what she's talking about. Um, and her approach to it is really enjoyable. So well, if you're reading a book, that's a good one to look at. I will look it up. So I'm a, we're reading one too. I, the, what's it called? The compound, show me. the compound effect. So we're just starting it. It's very much the, if you do this, you'll have this and then you'll be that. So it's like, if I mm -hmm. do this, work hard, I'll make a lot of money and then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. How do you be happy with what's happening right now? Like, how do sure. you bring that in? So it's like, 
I want to lose weight, so I'm eating better um, so that I can be happy. How do I bring that today and and enjoy the journey and get there and, and not feel like yeah. it's a finish line? But it's a tough one. I think if we knew how I'll to solve to, the problem, we'd we be should, yeah. rich, right? <laughs> we should come back to it in the next episode as I'm already thinking about different uh, aspects of the psyche that can be impacted in a situation like that. Uh, so you want to stick a pin in this one? Yeah, let's, let's put a, a pin in it and do a follow-up. All right. And, uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks for ta- oh, talking with me here. today. Yeah. Thanks. It's my therapy session. I tell you, <laughs> I feel a lot better after talking to you. So, um, if you guys are struggling with any form of addiction from, you know, just the things that I, you know, some would look at as easy sugar, Diet Coke, um, to the realm of high addiction, lots of addiction. Sure. Give you a call. Yeah. You know, you can, you can look up, uh, granite mountain, bhc.com if you'd like help with an addiction and you're in the northern Arizona area and uh, if you want other information on dopamine addiction or food addiction I actually really enjoy dopamine nation it doesn't necessarily it's not written explicitly for food it's, it's really talking about the mechanism that underlies addiction in general and uh, I'd recommend it heartily so awesome well thank you guys so much for tuning thanks. in thanks for being here my favorite part of the week Um, This is Power of the Mind with Granite Mountain Behavioral Healthcare and Greg Struve. We will see you next time. For information about mental health and addiction treatment, you can reach out to Granite Mountain Behavioral Healthcare online at granitemountainbhc.com. That's granitemountainbhc.com. Or give us a call at 877-338-6287. That's 877-338-6287. 6287. If you have a comment about this podcast or a question you'd like us to address in the podcast, you can check out the Contact Us page at my website, gregstruvy.com. That's G R E G S T R U V as in Victor, E as in Edward.com. This has been a Cast 11 production brought to you by Granite Mountain Behavioral Healthcare. This episode was produced by Austin Morrison. Follow Cast 11 on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Talking Glass Media.